Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Cost Control and Construction. We're going to be looking at change orders and I've got that phrase, measure once, cut twice. That is what change orders often feel like instead of measure twice, cut once, uh, which is what it should feel like. But unfortunately, we've got a lot of things that are challenging us. So this is the third in this series on change orders. And so we'll be just following up on some of the things that we've been and reinforcing some of the things that we've been discussing. And we'll sort of hone in a little bit on the different types of costs and those particular in, impacts and some of the common causes of change orders. Very common these days is design flaws. And I really empathize with designers and consultants because they're under a lot of time pressures. And I honestly feel like um, clients uh, don't often appreciate um, what they, the value that they provide. If we talk in lean construction terms, you know, the client really sees value in the finished building, the finished tangible stuff that you touch. They don't see the value in the drawings themselves. And so um, that has sort of a, a kind of a mental model view that impacts uh, the way that the work is done, which tends to be rushed and wanting things fast. And so of course there's gonna be design flaws as a result. Plus our buildings are very complex projects and we have very complex building systems that integrate and building science issues and all of these things converging. So of course there's gonna be some design flaws and there's gonna be things and gaps that are, occur. Um, discrepancies in the contract documents, things that aren't clear, unforeseen conditions discovered after the bid. Uh, sometimes you don't know what things are like until you actually start to excavate. And even though you've done soil samples and testing, uh, sometimes there's these unknown, unknown uh, occurrences that occur uh, that we come across and we have to make adjustments. Um, building code violations discovered into the process, uh, changes in the design of the building. Uh, somebody wants something a little bit different or something a, a new idea comes up or something's changed for what the end use of the design is going to be uh, and it needs to be now implemented into this project. So there's all kinds of these things, especially in today's environment where change is rapid. Uh, even when you have a well thought out and designed building, there might be a new technology that comes up partway through the process that you want to incorporate into the project. So that would involve a change. Um, so these are all things. Um, who really controls the changes? Well, the client does, of course. They pay the bills, so they control um, the change orders and they can determine uh, what they want to add or what they want to take away. Uh, and contractually, in most cases, the contractor is obligated to do that because this is what part of the standard contract requirements because otherwise contractors say, no, I'm not doing that. And that would cause all kinds of other kinds of issues. So if the changes deemed to be something that's uh, relatable or representative of the work that is being done uh, or needs to be done, uh, then that usually puts the contractor in the position that they need to perform that work. Uh, the sub uh, trades or the trade partners uh, is obviously that are working on this, whether it's electrical, mechanical, masonry, you name it, uh, is entitled to compensation for their direct and consequential costs. So we talked about the last lecture uh, direct and consequential uh, costs. Well, it's not just the general contractor that has these issues. It's also everybody downstream from the general contractor that has these issues, right? So there's cost impacts there. And the contractor needs to be able to sell that to um, the client. So specifications are written, you know, when we talk about contract documents, most part, they are written to protect the owners, to make sure there's clarity, that there's intent. Uh, and sometimes though, the intent can be questionable. Uh, sometimes specifications aren't always as clear as they should be. Uh, no written approval uh, equals no work done. So you gotta make sure that you get uh, written approval for a lot of things, or at least uh, the, right of, the right kind of documentation, like a change directive, if the pricing's not completed before it becomes a change order. So we have to make sure that we work through that. Um, and if you've, if you've already done the work, well, the balance of power is with the client. So uh, claims that are unresolved, that are left till the end of the project, uh, become much harder to negotiate successfully because uh, there's that old saying that um, they who own, 
hold the gold, uh, make the rules, right? Uh, and um, it's a little bit different than the normal golden rule, but um, basically work already completed has much lesser uh, value when you're trying to negotiate um, with that. So many contractors still believe, and we've kind of gone over this in the previous uh, two video lectures, uh, that changes are great. Consultants have the misconception that contractors get rich on changes. Uh, and really, uh, that uh, doesn't necessarily be, hold out to be true if you haven't really assessed the real cost of changes. And I'm not saying it's not true that a contractor's it can definitely be really good, especially when you have a large change and the client's adding a lot of extra work to the project. But sometimes a lot of these little interrupted changes, it can even be relatively uh, benign that you don't even notice it, is actually causing a lot of ripple effects uh, in your project. So something that could seem to be um, a $10,000 change is having a $100,000 impact on your project. That is very possible. Uh, especially if you're not really cognizant of that. So there's a lot of negative side effects that can go on if you're not careful. Direct costs of changes. Well, of course, we've got all these things um, that uh, may occur uh, during um, the process of an interruption to the work. Uh, so that's um, definite possibilities. Uh, we also have, um, you know, revise as built drawings, um, uh, critical path method revisions on our schedules. There's the time that we've got to replan that work that was already planned out. Uh, we know how much in pre-construction time that takes. Well, now we're doing it on the fly, uh, doing a thorough cost analysis of the impacts. That's why a schedule should always be inserted into, a into the schedule. A change order should always be inserted into the um, actual schedule so we can see the ripple effect of that change order on the rest of the work. And it's also very good from an explanation point of view to be able to walk through a client. We put this change in the schedule and this is what happened. And they can question things and then as long as you can answer those questions, then you've got a pretty good case. Uh, so we've got a number of elements that, that come in potentially. Here's some maybe not and some maybe yes. So it kind of depends. You know, there might not be any extra back and forth expenses uh, with that sort of thing. But again, there could be if it's a, a project that's out of town or that sort of thing that could definitely um, uh, come into play. Uh, permits, license fees, uh, small tools, tool rentals. Uh, maybe we were going to take down the scaffolding. Now we have to leave the scaffolding up another month as a result of this. Uh, so now we've got to rent the scaffolding another month as a result of this. Uh, bonding and insurance. Well, this could be a lost opportunity cost if we're at our peak limit of bonding and we can't take on new projects as a result of that because of our performance bonds. We've got on existing projects, delays that. So now um, that's a loss opportunity, a potential for other projects. There's a lot of things uh, that can go on. Hold back monies as a result of lien legislation and now we have to um, finance uh, that extra cash and that costs interest rates. So we're incurring those costs as a result. Those, those impacts come in. Uh, labor reassignment. Uh, well, we were going to move this crew to another uh, project and now they have to stay uh, or we have to take some of the crew away and now they're not working as efficiently as they were as a result because some have to work on this change aspect right now, but some have to remain. Uh, site access, uh, maybe the changes uh, making an area of the site not accessible for a period of time. So you can see how this plays in the previous video. We talked about long hours and how that can play into fatigue of people getting tired, working those long hours. You've broken up uh, the learning curve on the nice flow of work and now you've got to uh, go through another learning curve for this change. So maybe not as efficient as uh, starting up. You have stack effect because you have a lot of concurrent activities maybe going on. And if you've got rework as a result of the change, trades kind of like to do things one time and it's kind of demoralizing when you've got to rip out what you just did and start again. It's a very sort of uh, mental thing when you're a trade, uh, especially when you're really proud of your work that now you're taking out, even though you're, even if you're getting paid for it, there's a psychological impact uh, that goes on. 
uh, working in finished areas uh, because now the schedule's moving on and now you've got people that are actually in these areas and you're working around them. Uh, all of these things come into impact uh, your uh, ability to conduct the project effectively. So there's a lot of indirect and consequential costs uh, that come into play that we kind of mentioned in the last one, but now they're just being sort of detailed out so you really can see that and how that comes into play. Uh, even the time to sell the actual change is a cost. If you've got a lot of changes and you got a consultant that you know doesn't buy it, uh, and you're back and forth and emails and meetings and discussions before they finally sign off on it. Sometimes when you actually put a value on all that time, it's more than the change itself, especially when you have small changes. It becomes very problematic. That's why some contractors, they just let the small changes go because they know it's going to cost them more in negotiation and trying to sell it than to actually do it. Uh, which is also probably a mistake in the sense that then the client thinks, well, they don't even see that. They don't even know about it. Um, and that's a, a, a different kind of problem. So loss of opportunity, uh, as I mentioned, opportunity costs where you can't do something else because you're stuck doing um, this particular um, item uh, and the changes and how the impact that causes. So they're all uh, noted symptoms of that add to loss of productivity and uh, additional costs. And they are not always that e easy to calculate, but they definitely have a big impact on your bottom line. Uh, so um, indirect and consequential costs should be considered in that process and really thought of um, carefully identified as much as possible and um, gone after. Then there's also the cumulative. We haven't talked really about that, but the cumulative impact of change orders. So you've got a volume of them. It just becomes, it becomes chaos on some projects. Uh, I've seen projects where they had over 3000 changes and the client still wanted the project on the same uh, finish date. And it's sort of like you can't even keep up with all the changes and the impacts to the schedule. And they want it on the same uh, finish date and they're challenging a lot of the costs on these changes which is really sort of delaying things and that's preventing uh, you from getting on with the work which is further delaying the schedule so this is this cumulative impact of change orders not probably a big deal where you don't have a lot of changes on a project so that doesn't come into play uh, it can be this is really uh, difficult uh, to recover courts accept it Courts understand it, but I would say overall, it's not a lot of decisions that are made in favor of this process. Uh, but there are there are those cases where, and they've been in the millions of dollars typically, so that's why they've gone out the full nine yards because there was so much at stake, maybe six, $10 million cases uh, where there was a lot of changes and there didn't seem to be any understanding from the client or the consultant side that there's a cumulative impact of trying to keep up with all of this. How do you quantify the impact of changes? Well, it's very much like uh, we look at uh, what we estimated for the project and we've talked a lot in this course about the transference from an estimate to a budget the loading of a budget onto a schedule, having budget items that can be tracked and validated and uh, uh, monitored based on comparison to a baseline budget and a baseline schedule. And then there's also then, well, what are the approved change order work hours? And then if we look at all of them together, what's the delta? What's the difference between them? So why is there this difference? Now, a client would obviously want to say, well, you underestimated uh, the work hours. But what you want to be able to do is to prove that, well, we were actually going at a pretty good pace. And there's different tools that are used for measuring uh, that. There's one called the measured mile where it's very cl clearly measured on, you know, say it's drywall installation. You could very clearly show how the drywall was going in so many square feet per day. And this was the cost estimate per square foot. This was what was being incurred per day up to this point. And then after this point, because of this change, we were only getting this much productivity because we had to do X, Y, Z and we couldn't get into certain areas or we had to leave certain areas. 
then that's a good way of sort of demonstrating that, no, we actually had it priced well, but these are the impact points and then these are the consequential impacts that occurred as a result of that. So that could be helpful, but on a, on a uh, aspect of cumulative, you could also use it to say, this is the difference between this and this. And overall, because of, as, as you can see, these changes were added to the schedule and as they were ramping up, you could see the impact of how that was causing us further and further impacts. So labor hours increased due to change or our orders, right? Uh, these are key impact causes. PM, additional time required by the given project, your whole administrative staff on that project. So you, you've lost uh, some of your focus on the main project. Um, the volume of changes, productivity uh, um, uh, not being tracked. Well, that's gonna be a major problem for you or if you've got so many changes that it just becomes very difficult to uh, um, track productivity, that's a further problem. Uh, over allocating due to schedule changes, uh, change order processing time, timing that changes are received uh, and how quick it takes to get the turnaround and approval process because that can be a big stumbling block on projects and you really need to, to track the time frame from when you're putting in the change to when it comes back and have clear expectations of when you need a decision by. Um, so now how could we minimize it? Well, if it's not rushed so much at the beginning, uh, that would be very helpful. Different contract models other than lump sum for more complex projects like integrated project delivery, where you've got a sharing of the um, profits and you've got good engagement and collaboration using uh, lean methodologies in your scheduling to try to have really good work structuring where you're looking for opportunities in the design process to make sure that the actual operations process goes smoothly and you're being preemptive and proactive is very, very helpful. Um, that can really help a lot in those particular areas as opposed to a very fast track lump sum kind of uh, project that is not well designed, has been rushed, uh, where you've got a lot of interruptions to the work, then really are you benefiting as a client from pushing for a lump sum when you are inundated with changes which are causing all kinds of other disruptions on the project, making the contractor not be able to work that effectively and then putting you and the contractor in an adversarial relationship. If it's a fairly clear cut project and it's well designed, then there's nothing wrong with a lump sum price. But there are a lot of projects where it's not that clear cut and it has been rushed. And there are these kind of um, instances that, that occur that causes uh, these ripple effects uh, that uh, occur. Um, so we, we need to think about um, being able to um, seek fair and reasonable compensation uh, for that, right? And really the best uh, tools are well managed and detailed schedule that are showing how our um, work is being done and how it's impacted by the changes. And if you have a change order request, reserve the right to correct this quote for errors and omission. The quote covers direct costs only, and we reserve the right to claim for impact and consequential costs. The price is good for acceptance. You know, you would try, you should always try to cost out the work that you would have the proper amount for overhead and profit that you are seeking and that you've priced it out fair and reasonably for the time that you expect it to take and the impacts included because it's very difficult to get that back later. Um, but we definitely want to make sure that there could be further things that you could not see at that point in time. You did not know there would be another 20 changes that are coming that are going to interfere with this change in your ability to do this work. Uh, so that becomes important. We will commence the work on the change order after we receive a signed client acceptance of um, the change order. And uh, what's very um, important too is to um, try to make sure that uh, you include if there, this price is good for acceptance within 10 days from the date of receipt, you put a time frame on it. And if it's going to impact the schedule, you're also requesting a extension to the schedule. Now the client might come back to you and say, well, we want to actually finish on time. Well, that might mean that you have to rework it. 
And then that might mean that you got overtime and we talked about overtime. So that's where some of those things come back at you, right? Like the client, no, it's got to finish on this date. Is it possible? Can you remember the impossible zone we talked about between time and cost? Is it possible? And then if so, what is the extra cost, right? And what are we going to have to change to be able to make that happen? And then that's where you can really sort of show it on a schedule. And then you can use the direct method that we were talking about to try to look at how can you get that time back um, to the original start date. So these are some of the tools that you can utilize um, in this way uh, to help you um, reschedule the work. And when we talk about unit prices, you also need to think about uh, unit prices. Uh, if somebody's deleting something, I mentioned this in the previous video from the project, what about all the work you put into planning that part of the work? So if you put a lot of effort into that already, well, you definitely aren't going to be taking out what it costs to put in because already you've done some of the legwork on that. So you should really have a different, if you've had to give some unit price costing as far as you know, if we have uh, sheathing on the roof to be replaced or something of that nature, so much per square foot. Well, if somebody's taking a, a certain amount out of the project and you've had to do a lot of legwork in planning that, then when you take it out, it shouldn't count the legwork that you put in for planning that process. So that's why different pricing for adding as opposed to deleting elements, because a change can go both ways that you're adding something or that you're also um, deleting something. So really, uh, owners should have some responsibility uh, in that um, aspect and they should be willing to invest adequate amount of consulting dollars before tendering uh, and think through very clearly of their contract options uh, that, that occur. Um, so these, these uh, predominantly additions, deletions, designs, this one too, again, owners don't like to pay for that, but, and consultants want to fight that tooth and nail. So those are hard selling points. You really have to demonstrate them very um, clearly in those points. And you have to put the other, the hat of the other person. Consultant, of course, they're not going to want to admit to errors and omissions um, very easily. So you have to be careful of that and you have to know what you're up against when you're um, dealing with different delays and changes and scope gaps and things that are occurring on uh, projects from that um, perspective. And your responsibility really is to coordinate those changes, complete the project on time if that's possible, track labor productivity, monitor cost uh, escalation, and notify clients immediately if there are impacts um, to your ability to complete the project. It's only fair to notify the client as soon as possible, yet very often contractors don't want to deliver bad news and they delay it and the client uh, gets upset. So if, if you're in a situation where you're saying, well, we can't finish your project on time, and the if I'm the client, what do you mean? Well, you had so many changes, it disrupted the work so much. That's why we're not able to complete on time. If I'm, the, if I'm the client and you haven't told me the impact of these changes as it's been going along in the project, my answer, well, you can guess what my answer would be. My answer would be, if I had known that, I might not have made some of those changes. Why didn't you inform me sooner? So you have a, a responsibility as well in all of this to um, be able to uh, communicate the impacts and that builds good relationships and that builds trust and that greatly reduces conflicts and that means that you're in a much better position to negotiate uh, transparently and fairly uh, with the clients and you should be prepared that you can break down these costs and explain it to them. I just think that a lot of contractors have undervalued those costs very frequently and they haven't then they try to uh, sell something that they don't even believe themselves and at the end of the day they're not even charging enough for it um, so you really have to look at your costs and make sure that uh, you are valuing your your work and the interruption that it's having on the rest of the project so that you can actually recoup, recoup those costs um, so it's insanity to keep doing what we've always done expect a different result question is not what uh, the client uh, expects. The question is not what uh, the clients would like. The real question is, are you protecting your business, uh, its interests, uh, and acting proactively? 
So uh, with any of these things, really a business needs to protect themselves. You need to have good expertise, like a construction lawyer, somebody that specializes in this particular area. Make sure you're not signing anything in the contracts that are putting you in an unfair uh, advantage and making sure that the change order process and uh, things are being followed, notice of delay, notice of impact uh, on your projects are being um, transmitted in the timely fashion that the, the project um, contract requires. 10 day notice of delay, make sure that if you see an impact that's causing that, that you're giving those notifications. And believe in what you're pricing. That just means that you're breaking it down fairly and legitimately and you can justify those costs and impacts. So I've, I hope in the last three videos that you really can sort of see there's a lot of different things that maybe you didn't think of before. You just thought direct sort of costs and how that's impacting um, the project, but not much beyond that. So there's definitely a lot there to uh, consider. Uh, and uh, that's what I wanted to cover in this particular uh, video. So we'll see you next time. Uh, this is Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and happy change orders in your future. Bye for now.